Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I'm Verit Kogan, and I'm thrilled to reintroduce you to Dr. Roland McCready, who's been a guest with us before. Dr. McCready is Director of Research at the HeartMath Research Center at the HeartMath Institute. As a psychophysiologist, his research interests include the physiology of emotion, heart-brain communication, and the global interconnectivity between people and the Earth's energetic systems, which we're going to learn more about today. Findings from his research have been applied to the development of many educational programs and technologies to optimize individual and organizational health, performance, and quality of life. He has acted as, as principal investigator in numerous studies examining the effects of emotions on heart-brain interactions and on autonomic, cardiovascular, hormonal, and immune system function, as well as in studies to determine the benefits of self-regulation-focused interventions and heart rhythm coherence feedback in diverse organizational, educational, and clinical populations. Dr. McCready has been featured in a number of documentary films, such as The Power of the Heart, I Am, The Truth, Solar Revolution, The Living Matrix, and many others. And Dr. McCready, uh, it is really an honor to have you back on the show. And I have so much gratitude for the work that you and uh, others at the HeartMath Institute do for our planet. And we're going to learn more about that today. So thank you. Thank you, Vered. It's uh, great to be here. Help maybe some others learn about what we're doing. Yeah. And I think the world really needs to learn about what you and many other organizations around the world are doing, because I believe that it really has the capacity to transform um, our planet, if I may put it more generally, right, the trajectory of uh, our planet and the solutions uh, to the issues that we have. So how about we start off today by uh, introducing the Global Coherence Initiative? I know you've been with us before. We've talked about coherence and the impact of that on our physiology, and I welcome our listeners to go back and re-listen to that. Today's focus is on the GCI, which is the Global Coherence Initiative. What is that? Okay, well, why don't I start, Dan, being you asked that question with the mission statement. Um, I think that might be kind of a way to kind of give it a high level introduction. And so GCI or the Global Coherence Initiative, uh, it's basically a, it's a science based co cooperative project that's really intends to help unite people in heart focused um, love and intention to facilitate the shift in global consciousness uh, from instability and discord to um, more cooperation, harmony and, and increasing peace. Uh, at global scale is really what uh, this project's about. And it's the kind of umbrella for a number of other projects, if you will, um, all with that kind of mission or that purpose. And it is it is global in scale, but it also includes how do we get along better at every level of scale, right? I mean, from, you know, our kind of our basic model that we introduced I don't know, 15 years ago, is that if we're talking about coherence, you know, which is the cooperation, the collaboration in a certain way, the harmonious order of all the parts of the system, whether that's in our body, within a group, whether that's family, work team, business, you know, uh, companies, uh, or communities, and all the way to, to, to global and all three of those are important and, and interact in a way, because if you take a, a group or a team, a leadership team or a work team, a nursing unit, whatever that group is, it always it still boils down to the, co- I'm going to use the word coherence here, but uh, of the individuals that in that group, right? And by coherence, I mean, we can certainly measure and talk about that physiologically, you know, how well is our heart and brain working together, the nervous, the hormonal systems and all that stuff, which is critical to health and performance, obviously, in our, but especially in today's world, our capacity to self-regulate, right? Because that's, um, I mean, I'm going to hopefully weave this together in a way because I think it's important to tie in that, at least from my think, from my perspective, and I think there's a lot of support for this, that, that I'd say the root cause of society's biggest issues 
including in our workplaces, our families, certainly uh, globally, is disconnection. Yeah. That's our, I, our biggest problem. It's the separation and disconnection uh, we have within ourselves, but between people and all the extreme polarizations and biases that we see now um, and how that is affecting so many things at so many different scales. And then we'll also, um, from the GCI perspective, our disconnection with the larger world with, uh, and I mean, we're actually measuring this quite literally with the magnetic fields of the earth and being out of sync with not only each other, but with the rhythms of literal measurable rhythms of the earth. And kind of intuitively, I think most people would get that that's probably not a good thing, uh, Mm -hmm. being out of sync of our own health, our productivity, our performance. Uh, But it's nice to have science that backs that up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because when we are more coherent, when we're experiencing more of those elevated emotions, then, as you said, we're more productive, we make better decisions, we perform at a higher level, and we feel more connected with others, with the earth and with others. And so tell us a little bit more now about that research that you refer to, how um, how our our energy is connected with that of the earth. And of course, um, tell us a little bit more kind of about the research of the, the global coherence initiative. Yeah. So, okay. So that will go wide because that's kind of what we're doing at the, at the, level, at the scale of, of humanity in a way. Yeah. And that this could sound kind of um, not that I want to mean this in a disrespectful way, new age or something. And, and that's really not what I'm talking about. And we say being in sync with the earth or the rhythms of the earth. And so just to give a little kind of connect some dots here, um, my previous career before I became a psychophysiologist was I was a communication engineer. I used to work for Motorola, solving high-level problems and big communication systems and things. So we're um, very good now you know, from a technology perspective and using electromagnetic fields and waves to carry information around. That's how our cell phones work. I mean, we use a magnetic, that's really the magnetic component that goes through walls and things, right? That's why cell phones work indoors. But that's what's carrying the information, our text message, our voice, whatever we're, we're sending. We work the same way, right? And in fact, I would suggest that most technology is really kind of, an, we, nature already invented it. Um, and we're just sort of discovering it. And because we are, as you know, we're at the, when the heart beats, it radiates a magnetic field that can be measured quite a few feet outside the body. And how do I know this? We can measure it, right? You can put a probe out here called a magnetometer um, and see that field, and detect it. And you can do analysis, almost exactly the same kind of technology or approaches I used to use back in my Motorola days to decode or demodulate the signal being carried by a cell phone or a transmitter or whatever. You can do the same thing with the field radiated by the body and see that, at least especially our emotions, probably much more, uh, is being carried by that field. In fact, we can just stick a sensor out here and measure the information being carried by the heart's magnetic field and tell with about 75% accuracy what somebody's emotional state is, what they're feeling, and whatever their plastic smile might be. What, what's, you know, there might be the underlying anxiety or frustration or, or even more extreme sometimes. Those are information patterns, I call them, that are being carried by that field. So that's at the individual level. And just, well, probably should take that one more step. Um, Once we found that, and this is going back to the mid-90s, a long time ago, was seeing if there's a communication, subtle communication that's going on between people. We know we're broadcasting, but are we also receiving those fields? So yes, we are. There's no question of that. And so there's always this... For most people, unconscious communication that's going on whenever two people are interacting or in group settings. Now, of course, there's the body language, tones of voice, all that uh, is important. But there's this other, sometimes even more important communication going on. And this is important because this is the root cause of a lot of miscommunication problems. If you actually, you can watch this go on, right? Um, where anyway i don't want to go too far down that road right now it, that'd be another topic maybe someday but but, but so, it's an important topic yeah, it, 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 oh, it's very important 
And and what I mean by that is even in, um, you know, when we look at, you know, corporate teams, when there is more personal coherence, when people are more self-regulated, we see much uh, better function of teams, right? They're able to create decisions much more quickly. There's less drama. They're able to feel more connected. There's way more creativity. Meeting times are significantly reduced. Um, So it's the, the, you know, we always say change starts with you, right? As leaders. So we do our own work. And you said, then we radiate that energy, right? Out into this field around our body, which as you said, we can measure, yeah, but we're radiating that all the time, though, <laughs> right? It's, that's the um, issue. Now, let's just, just to go ahead and bridge this into more of the global scale. Um, and we've been actually, just before I do that, though, some of our current work has been looking at physiological synchronization amongst team members or group members, uh, which in the fields that we're talking about, I think, mediate that, how that can happen. And what we're seeing is that, in fact, we're developing a new, kind of harder to do than it sounds, but to do it in real time, uh, app to measure how in sync are group members or team members physiologically. And what uh, that this research is pretty clearly shown showing is that when there's a, I'll, I'll just say a positive and emotional connection of some kind, you don't have to be lovers or spouses, that kind of thing, but, you know, we like each other. There's a, uh, kind of an openness, uh, trust that you. What you do see is that the heart rhythms between team members synchronize or can synchronize. If there's that separation, you know, I'll work with you, but you know, forget, you know, I don't really like you. Um, you don't see it. You, I've yet to ever see that kind of synchronization. And so I've got a stack of papers over here on my <laughs> right. That's about two feet tall, really, that I've been collecting here in the last couple of years on this. Uh, topic and it's already pretty clear that physiological synchronization underlies or promotes we can call it pro-social behaviors but basically directly um, in one study tied to the quality of communication that goes on are we really hearing i don't mean physically hearing but uh what but that too i guess but understanding what somebody else is saying, because usually we're off thinking about something else or we don't agree. So that blocks a certain level of really hearing the other person. Um, And uh, collaboration, directly tied to collaboration. And those that uh, have more synchronization have more collaboration, more innovation and uh, better team harmony and dynamics. Um, So what we're, our aim here is through this new app that I'm not sure when it will come out, but is to have a way to not only measure, but help promote people getting in sync. So even we in our programs, we teach before important meetings, take even a minute or two and do an exercise to get ourselves coherent. And then that leads to more synchronization. That's what directly leads. I think the first time you mentioned shorter meeting times, I think the first time we measured that or saw that was many years ago. And I think it was Hewlett Packard, an intervention we did for them, where people were reporting our meeting times are half as long as they used to be. I mean, that, that alone was worth the whole program, right? <laughs> Many other benefits. But in, anyway, I'm kind of getting off in the, the trying to get back to the, the, the global level. But this is all important because it's individual, the relationships, the social, and the global are all interrelated, right? They, you, you can't look at them separately in a way. The, when I was talking about our heart rhythms, our heart rate changes beat to beat. It's always changing. And so there's an up and down rhythm that's always going on in our heart rates, uh, really called heart rate variability. And uh, uh, that's really important for a lot of other reasons. But when we're feeling good, when we're in that in personal coherent state, our rhythm shifts into quite literally into a different functional mode that we call co- coherence, or you can call it heart coherence or heart rhythm coherence. That's um, showing how we are as an individual in this optimal state. I mean, 500 studies now have shown independent studies. This is a good thing to learn how to do. There's a particular rhythm or frequency to that state. In frequency language, it's 0.1 hertz. It's a cycle every 10 seconds in in time. Now, where it gets interesting at the more global scale is, well, I'm going to have to ask people to kind of travel way back to um, science class back when we were in... uh, 
whatever grade it was, I forget, it's been too long ago for me, but you dump iron filings on a glass plate and you put your magnet under it. And right, they, it, it was kind of fun, right? You could, whether it's a horseshoe magnet or a bar magnet, you get to see the shapes of the fields and all that by your iron filings. But what I'd like you to re remember, recall, is that those little iron filings line up in parallel lines. So what that simple little experiment, a grade or grade school experimental also allows us to see and visualize are what are called magnetic field lines. So we, when we look at Earth, same thing, we have magnetic field lines, you know, the North Pole, South Pole, we're talking about the geomagnetic field, which of course those are very long magnetic field lines. Now, interesting, like what I didn't learn, I don't think any of us learned back in high school or whatever, or I actually didn't even learn it as a communication engineer until felt like later is that you can magnetic field lines can act like guitar strings or any stringed instrument. You can actually pluck them and they vibrate. Hmm. So when we look at the scale of Earth, right, what Earth is turning within the solar wind, and so is the sun's turning, but but so as it's rushing by, it's plucking the strings, field magnetic field lines of Earth, and they're vibrating. And the, the scientific term for this is field line resonances, the vibrating field lines of uh, and this has been measured for a long time. There's nobody connected the dots. And so part of the, the global coherence initiative is that we I wish we didn't have to do this ourselves because it's really expensive and very time consuming. But we now have a global network of magnetic sensing sites around the Earth that measure the resonant frequencies in the Earth's fields. To look at you know, how the, the field environment we live in is affecting health and behaviors and these types of things is, is part of that uh, the reason we're doing that. But the frequency, one of the primary resonant frequencies of the magnetic field lines of Earth is 0 0.1 hertz. It's the same, exactly the same, you know, the, this bandwidth of us, of our rhythms when we're in that coherent state. But even when we're not coherent, just there's a whole range that overlap our, our physiology. And there's a second set of magnetic waves. I won't go into all the details, but it's called Schumann resonances. There's eight of those. A lot of confusion about them. Out, a lot of nonsense, actually, out there these days in social media about, about them. But the key point is uh, they're way weaker, magnetically speaking, than the field line resonances. But they, all eight of these Schumann resonances overlap our brainwave frequencies. First one is 7.83 hertz, which is the same as that kind of point between alpha and theta if you're in brainwave frequencies. But... The point of all this is, if we can also try time travel back to science class, either you got to do the experiment yourself, and everybody's seen, you know, heard about it. You have two tuning forks, uh, mm -hmm. to the same note, right, same frequency, and you tap one, and the other magically seems like touch starts to vibrate. That uh, demonstrates what's called, or, or the principle of resonant coupling is what it's called. And in the case of our tuning forks, we've got air molecules mediating that energy exchange between the two tuning forks. And what this is basically telling us is that when things vibrate or oscillate at the same frequency, you can transfer energy and information between them. So again, it's how all, it's the basis of all radio, TV, communication systems is this principle. So what I've just explained is that our heart's rhythms and brain rhythms are vibrating, oscillating at exactly the same two primary frequencies of Earth's magnetic field systems. So we have the kind of, it's kind of a no brainer in a way to see that we have the basic physics of how we can, energy and information can get exchanged between the fields we all live in. You can't escape it. Even the space stations within the field of Earth, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, how we can be feeding information into that field and be affected by information in that field. There's absolutely no question that we are affected by the yeah, it's coherence or discord within the fields we live in. It is so fascinating, so fascinating. And Dr. McCready, for those people that are hearing this for the first time, um, you know, this realization that, you know, we, we are connected in that way, right? That the, you know, the earth's frequency and our brain's frequency, I mean, have similar resonances, you know, all of that is just, um, fascinating to learn about. And I'm curious now uh, for you to help us make the connection of what does that actually mean then 
for us as humans, what, in terms of our power, what does that mean? Yeah, there's multiple ways I can answer that. Um, it, we Let's start with, we don't like being in a discoordinate field. Mm. Our physiology doesn't like it. And um, for example, uh, when there's disturbed fields, like we get hit with a solar flare or something from the sun and the immersed field is disturbed, hospital emissions go up for about everything you can think of, especially mental, emotional uh, depression, anxiety. We feel it. We feel the tension in the field. Um, it, a lot of sometimes when people I won't say everybody, but a lot of people, when they really start understanding the science I'm talking about, start connecting some dots. Have you ever, have you ever woken up in the morning and, and just felt out of sorts? Mm -hmm. You didn't know why. It's not like you had an argument with your husband or something, but you know, you just wake up and you feel inner, even I'll say even energetically, something's kind of off. And yeah. usually if, you, if you're paying attention, you'll find that we just had a major magnetic storm or something happened that triggered a lot of people to feel a lot of anxiety or tension, a terrorist attack, a school shooting, something like that, where, where a lot of people were emoting, were feeling fear, anxiety, anger. That's all what I'm saying is all feeding the field. That's at the global scale. This also goes on within our, our groups and teams. Um, so that's kind of a real kind of, basic reason that this is important and we're actually in the process now been working on this a couple of years developing a new measure of the coherence of the of the earth's field a uh, subtler measure that can help us know when it's one of those discordant days energetically of, of the earth so we, we can take some steps to be more, a little bit more prepared coherently ourselves but let me take another let me give you another answer to that uh, two more, actually, I want to give you um, a study published last year. We we have a very strong collaboration with uh, two different research groups at the University of Lithuania, um, kind of ahead of their time in some ways, uh, a mathematics group and a cardiology group at the hospital there. And one of the, as they've measured what's called resting metabolic rate. This is a measure that you can do of how much energy the body requires to maintain basic life functions that, you know, when you're sitting here, like we are at rest. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what they found, this is over five years and a lot of, a lot of subjects, close to 500 people in the study is that when the resonant frequencies in the earth's fields are stronger, higher, you know, more coherent and stable, our resting metabolic rate goes down. There's a fundamental interconnection there. In other words, right down to the cellular level, where you are utilizing energy more efficiently when we're in sync or in, in a resonant field. Um, wow. All right. So these are basic kind of physiological health related. Now I studied that uh, we haven't, we just finishing the analysis. We did a, I don't know how much detail to go into here, but a large international study when we started seeing a, a surprising degree of synchronization of our physiology with the rhythms of the earth, I mean, way past what I would ever have predicted or expected to see. It was like, wow, <laughs> we're more fundamentally interconnected than I ever thought we, that we would see and be able to measure. Anyway, that led to a much larger study with groups in five countries. And the most recent thing is these, there were 20 people in each of these groups. So these are groups in, um, well, one was here in California, another one's in Lithuania, another group in Saudi Arabia, group in uh, New Zealand and, and, and uh, in the UK. Because uh, we were looking internationally to see, that, yes, we are synchronized internationally. That's another story. But what we're seeing now in this most recent analysis of that data is that these groups kind of came together to be part of this study. And they were, were meeting together, doing the different exercises and things. Um, is over the two-week period, of the, we were we were measuring our heart rate variability the little quarters we were 24 hours a day for two weeks 15 days actually okay. and what we're seeing is that the group's heart rhythms are synchronized now over the two-week period i would this, this is one of those surprises i wouldn't have predicted right as they came to to, to work together you know do these projects together and this is really cool because it supports a 
some findings from a, another colleague who actually worked in our lab here for a few years from a, who I was introduced to a little backstory introduced from one of my mentors, a very famous neuro, neuroscientist, neurosurgeon called Carl Prebram, um, kind of considered by the, he's the father of modern cognitive neuroscience by many people consider him that. Anyway, he introduced me to this researcher who had done his PhD dissertation as a social scientist on, by studying groups. And I, won't, I don't have time to go into all the details, but it, it was a very unique study where he didn't really ask anybody about the management structure or the leadership structure. And he did this groups all around the all around the country, 80 some groups and measured individuals to who knows who and, you know, who has power over who and that and all this stuff at all individual and was able to reconstruct the energetic relationships from this and able to show. Uh, that he called it love and power, that there has to be a balance between positive emotions, leadership. You have to have some structure, right? And But you also have to have positive relationships amongst the group members. And those have to be in balance. Too much structure, you, you crush the energy out of a group and, it, and innovation goes away. Not enough structure, everybody's running around doing stuff and no, but nothing gets done, right? So, but that, but that wasn't the the key finding that's an important finding for leaders to under really understand these energetic relationships. Uh, some of the groups that he studied had very high turnover, including leadership over the multi years of this study. And, but what was blow away to him, what he couldn't explain was that the structures, the, um, say the energetic structures, the relationships and these, these uh, structures that he was measuring stayed the same. Mm -hmm. He couldn't explain it. There was nothing in social scientists that could explain this finding. And that's when he got together with Dr. Prebram, who one of his claims to fame is he uh, you might have heard of the holographic perception theory. That was Dr. Prebram's theory to explain how the brain does some pretty amazing things that it does. A lot of people misunderstand what, what he was saying, but it's a very, he'll be proven right. It's eventually, I, I'm very confident that I, I've seen his data. So they got together and created a concept they call social holograms. So what this means, it, for this to be true and this to work, means that there has to be some type of a of an, uh, non-local energetic communication between group members that form when we work together over a long enough time. So there's a shared information field. So this really explains a lot of things, high performance teams, when you really have that, you know, it's kind of that magical thing. If you go to a concert or, or some teams just click and they work together, it's almost like you don't have to say anything, you know, what the other person is doing, thinking how they're going to collaborate. In a, in a, this is really the essence of, I think, truly high performance teams. So the data I just telling you about actually is supporting that, and that this is truly going on, even non-locally. But is um, yeah, so crazy fascinating, Dr. Roland, what you're, you know, Dr. McCready, what you're describing, because what this means is that when we really have that heart connection, you know, it's like, you know, our energy is almost like coming together, right, to create more energy, right, a higher amplitude, higher energy, and, and that that sticks, right, as you said, even when the teams are not together, that's, that's fascinating. You know, let me can I say one more thing about this, because when I talk about group or team coherence, you know, like some people that miss, I'm going to say misunderstand. Uh, I think it's a fear response sometimes that this means if we're if we're in a, a coherent group, that it means everybody's doing the same thing and we lose our individuality in some way. It's can't couldn't be farther from the truth. Let me give if we take us, for example, our bodies, when we're talking about coherence, you've got. Um, so many, I think it's 73 of the known octaves of the, the spectrum that, that for us to be a human alive people that have to be coordinated together. So you've got, you know, the heart, the brain, the liver, the, all the different glands and organs, the lungs, all doing very different things, very different jobs. And if you look at the, if you just look at one scale, right? Like the lungs doing the breathing, the rhythms and uh, the heart is doing something else. It could look like they're all doing their own individual thing. But when you back up and look at the wholeness, it's all perfectly coordinated. 
And that's what creates, you know, like coherence. One of the one of the aspects of a coherent system is the wholeness. The output is greater than the sum of the parts. It's the same thing in teams. So when we talk about team coherence, it doesn't mean everybody's doing the same thing. God no. It means that people are really uh, the, the team members that uh, you're really honoring people for what they're good at and letting them do their thing while somebody else is doing something else. But yet there's a coherence around the same goal, the same thing that we're trying to achieve, you know, and it, it starts to help people understand why you want differences mm. within team members, right? I mean, we don't always agree, but in an incoherent team, those differences end up being discord and mm. we, and, and the separation that I started talking about rather than being able to really hear each other out. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them, but to really hear them right. and to be able to come to a, you know, we are still in our language, there's still a heart connection. That's right. There is still a respect. Yeah, there's a respect. There's a wanting to actually understand where somebody's coming from. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And and that the team always comes out ahead and wins. Um, uh, in many ways, when you're able to really have that type of a coherence and within a group or a team setting. And I mean, it's, and what I'm saying is not necessarily easy. Is we have to, some team members will have to do their own work to get their own individual self-regulation and coherence, right? And be able to get a little bit past the, the self ambitions and, you know, the I frequency to really to go to the. Yeah. And what's fascinating is that using, you know, sensors like the inner balance sensor, you know, that we can have individuals measure and then have the team, right? Through the global coherence app measure, the team's coherence in real time and be able to see how we're doing as a team. And what I'm really interested in as well is then if we take that concept of the social coherence, right, the teams, and then we amplify that. If you think of many different teams, communities, countries, right, um, on a global level, what does that mean? Yeah, well, like our, our mission statement, uh, cooperation, compassion, compassionate care, increasing peace. You know, this the reason one of the reasons I actually got into what I do, um, how much time we have here, but... Mm. I, um, after I had left Motorola, I'd started a, well, I was, I don't, I don't want to go into too long of the story, but a little bit later on, I was created, started my own company, high, high tech kind of like electrostatics problem solving. And, and our, some of our customers were like Chrysler, Ford, you know, Intel, being big companies, we were solving some, some fairly serious issues. And like, and especially in the automotive industry at that time, and this would have been uh, eight, early 80s. Um, I, you know, I was having to install our systems in big factories. So I was working from everybody from the, print, the, man, the plant manager of these big factories all the way down to the union heads and factory workers on the floor. And I, it amazed me. I, I just couldn't understand how these companies could stay in business. The amount of discord and... The, the separation that I'm talking about, the battles, but it was just, God, I can't, it's hard to, for me to get my job done because of all this crazy infighting and stuff going on. Anyway, um, that, and then later I was involved in a, a project to bring, to help feed the world's hungry. Well, I guess I've always had this humanitarian streak in me to feed the world's hungry populations. And um, which we did, we pulled it off the demonstration plant to, to, to grow this thing called spirulina in the deserts of the world, way ahead of our time, you know, big spray dryer, solar powered spray dryers, didn't go anywhere. And I uh, realized that it, the problem is in, well, I can call it consciousness or awareness, if that's an easier term for people, there's really the root cause, it's that separation, back to that this separation and discord again, that without uh, that I wasn't really going to put my, well, where I ended up was I'm not going to put my life energy into these kind of projects unless it's something that can really help raise people's awareness, their, their consciousness. Um, otherwise, I'm wasting time. It's not a technology issue. We had the technology. I'll give you uh, then more in the last few years I had read somewhere that with 10% of the world's military budget, what we spend on war and defense that every man, woman, child on planet Earth could be housed, have clean water, fed, and educated. Hmm. Now, I couldn't find the source for it. You yeah. know, it, it, I thought that's a pretty wild, this really illustrates the problem, right? 
And then, but uh, in a couple of years ago, about three years ago, I met Celia Ellsworthy, who wrote the book, The Blueprint for Peace, or The Business Plan for Peace. She's been nominated for, for three Nobel Peace Prizes now. And she, we were having this conversation, and she says, no, no, Roland, you're, you're wrong. It's far less than 10%. And she did the work to really show this and wrote a book about it. So now I have the real source. So if you think about this, for less than 10% of what we spend on war and defense, that we could solve the fundamental problem of why we're having wars. Yeah. And this is... This is a problem in consciousness, in awareness. Not a, yes. We don't need some new technology. I'm with you. And the research that you and your team and other teams do on this, on global coherence, is really essential for this global shift in consciousness. Because when we see with science that when we are more coherent, not only are we healthier, our teams and families, our communities are healthier, but on a global scale, we can solve these problems, right? Like feeding those that don't have enough. And, and I think that what's exciting when I think of GCI, you know, the Global Coherence Initiative, is the correlation what you've seen between kind of solar cycles and, and having more energy and increase in energy during that time. So when people are more coherent, when they're doing the work to radiate more of those elevated emotions, more ease, more appreciation, care out into the field, that that amplifies that coherence even more. And that will accelerate the this new shift in consciousness that you speak of so tell us about that if we can well if what i've been saying is correct that we what i'm because i'm really saying is that it's a bi-directional system we're affected by the fields but we're also feeding the field all the time and co- one of the qualities of a coherent system right is it comes into a higher state a more optimal functional state And in terms of the energetics or the magnetic information, when we're coherent, we're feeding a more coherent field that's coupled to the larger field. So when we become more individually self-regulated, more caring, right, Uh, more self, more have extending more compassionate latitude to coworkers. We don't know what's going on in their world. That's also affecting the global field. Mm -hmm. And as we put one of the qualities of coherence, I like to say coherence organizes noise. Um, so that puts a signal out that helps others kind of find their balance, uh, maybe come to their next level at their own individual level. So it, we have to do both, right? It is, you can't just sit in a cave or sit in your office and, you know, meditate and uh, radiate, you know. Um, yes, we do have to do that. We do have to be becoming more responsible for what we're feeding the field. If nothing else, do it for our own self because it directly affects our health and well-being. Right. But it's also in a measurable way impacting those around us. We, we know this. And if we want, you know, if you're a leader and you want to build a coherent team, you got to start with yourself. That's yeah. right. Um, and, and pay attention to these things and help your team members. You know, good business. But it's also helping the world. Yeah. And so we have to do both. We have to be responsible for energetics, what we're feeding the field, but we also have to. Um, Learn how to better self-regulate. Learn some of the skills. And uh, I mean, we I'm not, not just here at HeartMap, but a lot of different organizations are developing now to help move us forward. Yeah. And, and, and I think that at the heart of this, of course, is uh, as leaders to have greater influence. Yes, we wish to have positive influence, you know, on individuals, on teams, on our organization, and of course, our world. And, you know, the ability to radiate a more coherent field and having that along with others like us in a team environment that share the same intentions, higher intentions, that creates that even higher energy, creating a bigger wave in our world to be able to, um, you know, soften some of the extreme things that we're noticing in our world right now, these extreme polarities. If, if it's okay, if we can um, just speak a little bit about, because I'm super fascinated by some of the historical research that we're seeing around the correlation between some solar activity and 
human, social, political activity. Can you tell us about that? Because every time I share that with teams, everybody just goes, right? It's just mind-blowing research. This Well, this goes back to really the father of the field of what's called helo biology. Helo meaning sun. Uh, Alexander Chesovsky, who's a, who's a Russian astrophysicist, um, who, uh, I don't know if it was fortunate or unfortunately, got drafted into World War I. And so he was on the, out in the front lines and, and, and at that time. And being a solar, you know, an astrophysicist, he was kind of interested in what, keeping one eye on what the sun's doing. But it occurred to him, it looked like that during high solar activity, the behaviors of people down here on earth changed. They, we kind of got stupid. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of your battles, just poor decisions being made, things like that. So I got him intrigued. So after, after the war, he did um, pretty, it's a, kind of amazing to read some of these re- researches. This is his pu- work was published in 1926, but, but he went back to 1749. This is far, how far back at that time there were records for solar cycle activity. And basically, he did a pretty exhaustive study of human history. Amazing what, how much work this took back then. But we didn't have internets and all this stuff. But anyway, what he did is he constructed a graph that showed a number of major human events every year from 1749 to 1926. A bit long, many cycles. Just put a, you know, a dot on the graph. The picture's worth a thousand words here. There we ah, go. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so the top line on that uh, one of my publications is the number of major human events that occurred each year, like revolutions, um, war starts of wars, global impact type things. And so we're starting on the top graph and then far left in 1749, and it wraps around on the bottom, the top of the bottom, the blue line to 1926. The red line is the the solar cycle for that same time period. So you, you really don't need fancy statistics to see the correlation there. I mean, it's this is, and this has been verified by many many people ever ever since. Uh, so this is showing a, a really deep and fundamental interconnection, if you will, between um, the magnetic field. I mean, Earth and it, our magnetic field is within the magnetic field of the Sun, and right? it extends out and includes the Earth and all the planets. So what we and um, Chesovsky at that time, he was a very good scientist, actually predicted. This is remember 1920s. Um, we didn't even know about hormones yet, or let alone uh, higher energies like X-rays and ultraviolet. None of this was known at that time. But he predicted that there had to be some unknown radiations from the sun that were affecting our physiology. From some of his physiology studies at that time. So he actually has since now shown things we now take for granted. Right? And we know that during the solar cycles, the sun is literally emitting more energy in these other, in, in um, what's called the F107, it's a solar radio flux, it's a 2.8 gigahertz radio signal, um, ultraviolet radiations, all these different things. And so that work and some of our studies we haven't talked about today uh, actually are showing that we get energy. These are energy sources for trees us not just uh not just the food we eat but i i'm I'll tell a fun story here i'm getting ready to do a present a, a new seven week course and uh one of the things i'm talking about this is an actual real real study that was done of migratory birds where a group of scientists measured caught these birds and tagged them and measured their weight very carefully and everything and and you can do studies to calculate how much energy expenditure they have to do to flap their wings and how many joules of energy gets burned and all that stuff, right? So anyway, these are migratory birds that had to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. You know, so they can't stop and eat. And, not <laughs> make them. and then uh, anyway, the, I'll make a long story short. So they captured them, you know, after they arrived and measured their body weight again and found that the amount of loss in body weight was nowhere near what it had to be to explain the energy expenditure for the flight. So the conclusion was that it's scientifically impossible for birds to fly across the ocean. Like this. So my next, in my presentation, next slide, it says, but the birds don't know this. (laughs) (laughs) 
right? But the point is that they're, they're getting energy from some other source, not just the calories and things we eat. So some of our studies that are showing exactly the same thing, right? That when we have, um, we were using um, one study, one of our studies was five months of people wearing these heart rate durability recorders. And when things like the, what's called uh, solar radio flux, so F107, it's also called, is up, our HRV goes up. But we also sleep better. We have, we're, we think clearer, better cognitive processes. Um, so it's an energy influx and that we're able to see. So the kind of the moral of the story is that we all live within fields within fields. And they're, they're sources of energy for us once we start to understand it. And when we're resonant with them, we have more energy. Yeah. When we're not, we don't. We, we lose that benefit, that energy benefit. And when we're not aware of it, we have these energy influxes. Well, what's one of the studies are showing, if we're not well regulated and we're a politician, we go start wars. Right? Things like that. Um, or we um, make dumb choices. Anyway, um, but I guess more and more studies are starting to really prove this fact. That one, uh, if you want, I don't know how much time we have. I can give you another. I, I got all the time in the world. Oh, I don't. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I don't know what time it is. The um, what our Lithuanian partners, I was mentioned earlier, uh, a big hospital, teaching hospital. And so they have access to all the data, hospital missions from multiple hospitals. And this is going back a few years at kind of uh, one of the early studies they did looking at our, who had one of our magnetometer sites, they kind of hosted and keep an eye on it for us there in Lithuania. And they were looking at overall hospital admissions. And, and I'll make a long story short here. What they found was that when the resonant frequencies, we have a high resonant, or call it coherence, magnetic power, that hospital admissions for elderly people, you know, that usually have some other problem, you know, heart disease or this or that, were lower. But when the field power dropped, hospital emissions went up. Right? Wow. But it was reversed in young populations. When the magnetic field present was higher, they had more hospital emissions for youngsters and less when it was lower. However, there was a big difference in why they were being admitted. The kids, right, the youngsters were being admitted for accidents. Mm. In other words, there's more energy in the field. They were going out and doing stupid things and getting hurt. Wow. Right? Makes sense? Oh, my like, goodness. Yeah. So that kind of, they, 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 they puzzle over this. And their, their in conclusion, independent of me, was we have to be drawing energy from the fields we live in. Wow. You know, this is such a superpower, Dr. Mercredo, when people really get this and feel empowered to manage their own energy, yes, to self-regulate, you know, it really is a superfire, a superpower, because, you know, that higher energy is amplified when we're in these kind of solar cycles, when there is more energy. And it also brings more compassion, because if we've made ourselves some pretty stupid mistakes in our mm -hmm. life, you know, yes, there's some ownership there and we need to be kinder with ourselves because maybe when we were incoherent, that was amplified even more. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And if, if we start beating ourselves up and, you know, how stupid I am, that, that's a downward spiral of our own energetics. And, and, and uh, yeah. but at the same time, we have to be responsible, learn from our. Can we use the research to predict when stuff will happen? Wars, tsunamis, earthquakes, that kind well, of thing? Uh, certainly, I won't say you can get specific to a war is going to break out here or a I mean, a lot of things go along with the cycle, traffic accidents, a number of tickets, police right, all right along with this cycle. Um, so you can predict that there's going to be an increase in these types of things, right? But you can't get specific to say, you know, so-and-so is going to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's, but I, I started earlier by saying that GCI kind of houses a lot of other things. So um, one of those is we were also measuring trees. So we have a global project for measuring the electrical activity of trees around the world. And because they have a very rich, very dynamic electrical lives and circadian rhythms, just like we do. So that's, that gives us another living system to look at the interconnectivity between us and the fields and 
But then also more recently, there's a project called the Global Consciousness Project um, that you might be aware of. It's been I am. We've had Roger, Dr. Nelson. Oh, okay. Good. On the podcast. Yeah. yeah, great. Awesome. So, you know, Roger started that 25 years ago at Princeton. Um, and asked about two years ago, asked me to take it over. So we said yes and spent the last two years. First year was really saying, okay, what have we learned? Technology has come a long way in 25 years. What would we do different? So we, the last year, we've completely redesigned that, built, rebuilt it completely from the ground up, new network, new devices mm -hmm. um, to measure what uh, we all, those of us in the core team think of as glo a global consciousness, a, a field effect that you can measure globally. Um, in response to large events that trigger a lot of emotion, as you, you well know from Rogers. The why am I telling you this? Um, anyway, that's now housed with under GCI. So we so we've got multiple systems coming together under one roof in a way, along with the Global Coherence app, which you mentioned. It's allowed it allows us to measure people, how coherent are we in groups of people? So we we're on the I think the beginning steps of a, a whole new era in yeah. the science of really understanding the inner, the fundamental interconnected world we live in and how we can, oh, I, I know, but just, I just reminded myself. So the, the data from that project, the Global Consciousness Project, uh, one of our collaborators and colleagues is a, a, a financial analyst um, from, from Switzerland, very smart guy, you know, financial mm -hmm. models and all that. And we started incorporating the data from the, the Global Consciousness Project into his financial models. And when you include that it, as a predictive, that's what triggered this. It's about a five to eight percent in additional returns on your investments above just the, the normal financial model, very good financial modeling, predictive model that they've developed. Wow. Because uh, it, it's really, and what we, how we think of this is it's a measure of global mood or mode, uh, global sentiment. Uh, we're all feeding the field. So this is yet another detector, another way of seeing how that's um, the interconnections between yeah. humanity, what we're emitting and what we're vibrant, you know, our awareness. Yeah. And you know, I think this whole conversation, Dr. McCready, is about empowerment, self-empowerment. Yeah. Yes. And then, of course, in turn, the team or social empowerment and then, you know, globally empowerment and i'm curious before just as we complete here if you have another minute just curious a little bit more about you you started to tell us a little bit about why you got into this what is your hope dream vision for this work i would go back to the mission statement for gci i think it says it really well um i guess i just kind of came into the planet um with a deeper curiosity, a deep, you know, I, I was a kid building radio receivers in, you know, high school and stuff, but, um, and it, I was never satisfied though with even in college and things, you know, like what, what is a magnetic field or an electric field or this and that. And it was, well, here's the formula that describes it. No, no, no. I, I got that. What is it? No, no, no. Don't ask that. I mean, it, it, it was really kind of that, you know, we still don't really know. I mean, we've got better theories now than we did back then. But um, so that's what I, I guess led me to California and kind of doing what I do. And, and uh, it wasn't why I got into the spiraling thing and wanted to, wanted to leave the world a better place. Right. And, uh, have and fun along the way. That's right, and have fun. That's well, right. And I, and there's also I'm a bit selfish um, in that a lot of the stuff I've gotten into is really for me. How do I perform better? And yeah. how do I? I mean, I want a brain, and I want it to work really well. And what our work has really shown is that you have to get the heart and brain in sync for that to happen. That's right. If you come in through the the, the heart and the energetic heart, uh, that really opens a channel to to our deeper self of who we really are and we're able to then bring in that information into our day-to-day -day lives and that's what allows us to better self-regulate to make better choices and to experience more joy have more fun as you yeah. said what do you want every single leader listening here today to really embody and practice well i would invite leaders to look a little, look under the hood a little bit more 
um, of the team dynamics of what's really going on at the, at, I'm, I'm going to, I don't like, like to make predictions, but I would say awareness of our energetics, our own energetic system and our team's energetics is the next frontier. It's where, where we're going, if we're going to uh, survive in a certain way. Um, but it's certainly the key difference between a mediocre or an average team and a, and a high an exceptional team or leadership group. So I'd say, you know, not, you don't have to learn heart math, although that's a great way to go. Um, but, but starting to understand uh, some of these concepts and, and how it's not that hard. Mm-hmm. That's right. I mean, yeah, you got to expend some energy and learn stuff, but it, but the benefit, it's wild to me, the benefits of bringing these, some of these concepts and these practical skills and tools in the payoff is, you know, it's nine or more to one. Um, yes. And the practice takes, you know, less than 10, 15 minutes a day often. Yeah. So how can people learn more? about heart math, the practices, how they can do this work to elevate their own energy, their team's energy, and of course, collectively our global consciousness. Uh, well, heartmath.org is our, our website. It's a great place to start. And from there, there's kind of places you can go to learn more about some of the other projects we talked about today. And you can actually see there on our website, we have the magnetometers from around the world. You can see the live data if you're interested in that. Um, we have the pro- programs for certification programs just for building team coherence. Also, you know, I'll just kind of do a shout out. Really, I was on, I'm was honored to say we, a number of years ago, uh, got the contract to develop the resilience program for the U.S. Navy. And so I have some experience in culture change. <laughs> it's really climate change. The culture of the Navy was really quite good, you know, their ethos and stuff. But the climate has a problem. Or did. This was the highest stress mission in the military at that time. This is during the um, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan war eras. And, and uh, one of the, uh, I don't have time to go into a lot of details here, but uh, I personally trained about 5,000 men and women uh, in the working with SEALs. We still do that and stuff now, talking about high performance things. Mm-hmm. And th- this, Again, it was the highest, I won't go into details, highest stress mission in the military that we were working with. And that 80% of these men and women within three months of being deployed on this particular mission were on a prescription sleep medication because of the, the stress. By the time we got done, and this took some energy, it took some effort, but we learned a lot about how you create a climate change within large organizations and the payoff. By the time, after five years of doing this work, the last kind of, there was hundred, there were over 180 people in each cycle of deployment. And, uh, less than 5% were on a prescription sleep medication for the entire year long deployment. Wow. And it, it really doesn't take any extra time. You just have to care enough to want to understand this stuff and, and uh, be able to do it. That's right. And so many people now are suffering from anxiety, you know, really high degrees of stress, overwhelm, and this can help them and their families. So once again, Dr. McCready, I'm so deeply grateful to you for your uh, commitment to this higher work, your life's mission, and uh, of course, for being with us again today on the podcast. My pleasure, Karen.